Hey guys, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So today's case is going to be about a woman who fell into a dark path in life and was pretty much just ignored by law enforcement. It's one of those cases that I saw in my email and just felt like I had to cover it because I don't want to let her be forgotten. Her case deserves to be heard and her story deserves to be told. She's not just someone who deserved to be swept under the rug and completely forgotten about. I just hope that by doing this video today that someone will see her face and remember something that maybe they didn't even know that they saw or maybe enough people will see it that law enforcement realizes that they made a huge mistake by just ignoring this young, beautiful woman's disappearance. Either way, I hope that you will all watch this video and just take a moment to appreciate a life that everyone else seemed to ignore. With that being said, today we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Camille Dardanes. Camille Dardanes was born February 23rd, 1964. She grew up in an upper middle class family in Chicago and those around her described her as being a very intelligent, kind, and mature woman for her age. She was known to be empathetic and for always seeing the best in others. She was very talented and beautiful and had everything going for her growing up. She got straight A's in school. She danced ballet for nine years and became a semi-pro ice skater. She seemed to excel at everything she put her mind to and there was no stopping her. Now, when Camille was 21 years old, she began to sort of notice a man named Gary Dotson who was in the news quite a bit. He was a high school dropout who grew up in the suburb of Chicago with his mother and three sisters. In 1977, Gary was accused of sexual assault and was found guilty and sentenced to 25 to 50 years in prison with another 25 to 50 years for aggravated kidnapping, which was going to be served concurrently. However, his case got national attention when his accuser had actually came out in 1985 after Gary had already spent many years in prison saying that she had lied about the entire Thing. This woman was 16 years old, living with foster parents at the time when she made up this story so that she could actually get contraception after having a consensual encounter with her boyfriend. So she felt like she had to come up with this entire lie to her foster parents to make an excuse to get that contraception. But DNA evidence actually did prove that he was not responsible for the crime and was exonerated in 1989. Now, this case became so famous because Gary Dotson was actually the first person to ever be released from prison after being exonerated by DNA evidence. As Gary's case was taking the media by storm and was all over the TV, Camille saw him and was immediately totally infatuated with him. Camille's friends noticed that every time his face would come on the news, Camille ran to the TV to go and watch. When they asked her if she knew this person, she said, no, but I will. So it seemed that she sort of saw this attractive young man on the TV and was just very intrigued by his story and everything that was going on with him. When Camille found out that Gary's clemency hearing was open to the public, she decided to attend. Others in the courtroom watched as Camille walked up to Gary Dotson and handed him a single white rose, which became a highlight in the story as it was reported on numerous newspapers. After this happened and Gary was released in 1985, he couldn't get that beautiful young woman who brought him this carnation out of his head. As soon as he got out of prison, him and Camille immediately began their relationship and quickly became married also in 1985. This was a huge story around the town. The marriage was written about in all of the newspapers, they were being photographed everywhere, and they once even appeared on Good Morning America together. Also, after they had gotten married, Gary's false accuser actually wrote a book called Forgive Me. This book was 
basically about this woman's story. She said that she was mentally disturbed. She had a very rough upbringing and was sexually active by the age of 12. So in 1986, she signed over $17,500 in royalties over to Gary as sort of an apology for lying and putting him in jail. He also got money from the justice system many years later, but at this point, he had just gotten that $17,500. Initially, Gary and Camille used this money to relocate from Chicago to Las Vegas, Nevada. It was also at this point that Camille had also given birth to their first and only daughter, Ashley. Camille was pretty much living the dream at this point. They had all of this money and were able to move across the country and they were living this high life with their brand new daughter. But this dream did not last very long. They blew through their money in a matter of months and Gary began drinking. He started drinking more and more and the more he drank, the more violent he became. They were left with almost nothing and ended up having to relocate back to Chicago. Now, the violence problem with Gary only got worse and worse. At one point, it got so bad that Camille had to get police involved after he hit her and threatened her and their baby daughter. She told police about his behavior and he basically admitted it. He tried to explain to police about the fact that he had been drinking a lot that night and said, quote, I'd kill the kid before I let Camille take her away. So clearly this was a very serious situation, but Camille decided not to go forward with the charges against him and pretty much just started vouching for him. She said, quote, Gary is far from a criminal. I was tired. Gary was tired. The baby was screaming. It had just been a very long day. Now, of course, obviously a lot of people will question why she decided to change her mind why she decided to defend him after he did something so awful to them. But this is something that is very common among women who are abused. They will try to go and press charges against their abusers, but then turn around and decide not to go forward with it. A lot of times it's because they are scared of what their abuser is going to do to them if they do press these charges. Other times, abusers will gaslight their victims and make them think that whatever their abuser is doing to them is their own fault or that it's really just not a big deal and that, you know, they shouldn't even be concerned with what's going on. Which, with Camille, I think that that's what happened. She started making excuses for his behavior probably because he made her believe that what he was doing wasn't a big deal and that they did have a child together and that the reason for his abuse was because they had this baby together. But either way, things between Gary and Camille just kept getting worse and worse. Gary had received several DUIs and had gotten into a bunch of drunken bar fights. She did decide to break up with him and get him out of the house, but he would just break into the house and would refuse to leave. This did lead to him being arrested for trespassing and this time, she stuck to her guns. Camille filed for a legal separation and decided to move back from Chicago back to Las Vegas with baby Ashley to live near her mother. However, Camille didn't have a degree. She didn't have a lot of education and didn't have much job experience, so once she was on her own, she struggled to support herself and baby Ashley. She had worked several low-wage jobs at diners and bars, but eventually ended up as a dancer at several different nightclubs. First, she worked at a nightclub called The Crazy Horse, located on the Paradise Market Strip on Paradise and Flamingo, which was owned by a mobster named Jack Gallardi. She then went on to dance at another club in the same chain, called Crazy Horse 2, located at the Industrial and Sahara, which was owned by an associate of Jack Gallardi, Rick Rizzolo. While working in these clubs, Camille started using various substances such as pot and cocaine. It was also around this time that Camille met another man at the nightclub who she quickly fell for. This man was George Diaz Jr., but went by the nickname Cruz. This relationship was described as a whirlwind romance. Camille got the name Cruz tattooed on her hip, and the two were married extremely quickly in 1993. However, this whirlwind of exciting romance did not last long, 
because soon after the two were married, Cruz began physically abusing Camille. Camille's daughter, Ashley, remembers Cruz as being an overwhelming presence who made her very uncomfortable and afraid. Their relationship continued to spiral and eventually Cruz started introducing Camille into harder drugs. Soon she developed a serious crack addiction and became involved in prostitution. This started off with regulars at the nightclubs that she worked at but soon turned into something that she did do on the streets. Of course, with being involved in these various illegal activities, Camille was being arrested pretty regularly. She was stuck in an abusive relationship. She was addicted to several different substances. She was in and out of jail all the time. Her life was in an uncontrollable downward spiral and there just did not seem to be any way out. So at this point, Camille's mother, Barbara, moved back to Chicago and took seven-year-old Ashley with her. But once the two left Las Vegas, they would never see Camille ever again. Now, after Barbara and Ashley left, Camille was at a point in her life where she was just completely unrecognizable to those who knew her before she got involved in all of this. Her teeth were completely yellow from all of the substance abuse and the years of heavy smoking. She had several warrants out for her arrest and her face was all banged up and her nose was broken after Cruz's violent episodes. Camille was starting to act very afraid all of the time. She started feeling as if someone was following her. She told her friends that she was terrified of something, but never told them exactly what. Ashley and her would talk on the phone all of the time, and with Ashley being so young, Ashley could tell that something was wrong with her mother. During their last ever phone call, Ashley said that her mother almost sounded like she knew she was leaving and was never coming back. Camille told her daughter that she loved her and told her to be a good girl. Everyone around her knew that her life had taken a dramatic turn for the worst and she just was not in a good place. Now, with most of these missing person cases, I am able to say this person went missing on this date around these different circumstances. However, with Camille, we don't actually know when she went missing. She was just there one day and then gone the next and no one seemed to notice or care. No one did anything. Around seven months after Camille had spoken to her mother or Ashley, Barbara went back to Las Vegas to see what was going on with her daughter. This is when she found out that no one had known where she was for over half a year. Barbara went to the Las Vegas Metro Police Department to file her as missing, but they wanted nothing to do with it. They said that there was no reason for them to believe that she was met with foul play or went missing under suspicious circumstances. They did absolutely nothing to try and find her. She was last known to have been seen around the 300 block of South Casino Boulevard in Las Vegas, but other than that, we don't know a single thing about her disappearance. So Barbara just decided to go out and look for her daughter herself. She went around and hung missing persons posters. She visited everywhere that she knew Camille worked. She questioned several people that Camille was known to hang around. She did everything that she could in the area to search for Camille, but found absolutely no trace of her. Some might say that the trail went cold, but there was no trail to begin with. Like I said, she was just there one minute and gone the next. No one looked for her. Those around her either didn't notice that she was gone or just didn't care one bit. No one thought to tell her mother or her daughter. By the time Barbara got to Las Vegas, everyone had moved on with their life and completely forgotten about Camille. The people whose job it was to help search for her did absolutely nothing and wanted no part of it. Camille went missing in 1994. By 2003, Camille's childhood friend Sherry found out that her friend had been missing and decided to call the Las Vegas Police Department to see if there were any updates in the investigation into her disappearance. 
It was at this point that she discovered that there was no investigation in the first place. Apparently, Camille's missing persons report had been deleted by someone in the police department just a few weeks after it had been filed. We have no idea why this happened. Maybe whoever did something to her is somehow connected to the police department, or maybe the police just didn't want to look into her case because they didn't think that it was very serious, so they just got rid of it. But either way, it was deleted and not a single person had looked into her case at all. But at this point, police had finally admitted that nine years is quite a while for someone to go missing and have no contact with someone without fall play being involved. So they finally labeled her as endangered and missing on a new report that they refiled. But of course, it had almost been 10 years at this point and gathering evidence and trying to figure out what happened was very difficult especially being in a big bustling city like Las Vegas. Ashley provided police with a DNA sample in case they ever did find an unidentified body, but other than that, nothing else was done. It was impossible to start looking into leads or uncovering new information since they didn't even know the day that she went missing or who she was with or literally any other single detail about what happened. Now, that is where it had been left for quite some time. However, things picked back up in just the last year and new information has been discovered. Now, this case was suggested to me by someone named Gabby, who put help my friend find her mom in the subject line. She then kind of gave me a quick rundown of what happened and then linked me to an article by the World Press and said that the information in this article is the most accurate since other sources like the Charlie Project are using most of the information from these faulty police reports. So of course, that is where I got most of my information from with some other information coming from other sources that I feel are trusted. This article was published by someone named Help Find Camille, so I'm not necessarily sure if I know who the author is, but I think it is Gabby, the girl who emailed me, because in the email she did kind of mention that this article was something that I think her and Ashley had written together, but I'm pretty sure that this article was written by Gabby and Ashley, and at the end of the article, they kind of wrote about how the two of them went out and tried to track down information for themselves because again, no one had done anything. Which I just think is so amazing that Ashley and her friend are just going out there and doing this work that police refused to do to help find her mother. Together, the two of them gathered a team and eventually strangers to come together and go out and find the answers that they needed. They sifted through court files, arrest reports, public record requests, and various tips to learn about Camille's last year in Vegas. So around the time that Camille went missing, Camille and Cruz were actually separated. Camille was living at 2110 Paradise Road, apartment 2006, with a different man named Francisco Kiko Fernandez. The two were actually arrested together on September 2nd, 1994 with the indictment being held on September 26th. This was the last recorded time that anyone had ever seen her alive. Now, in regards to Kiko, they found out that he was actually known to occasionally leave the U.S. to go to Mexico and or Cuba. So, one of the ideas relating to this is that maybe Kiko had actually helped Camille escape the U.S. and she's hiding in one of these countries. Ashley is obviously hopeful that this is the case, but she's trying to stay cautious with what she chooses to believe. We also know that Kiko Fernandez does have a record of domestic battery charges. So being that he was the last person that was known to be living with Camille, it's possible that he is responsible for her disappearance because maybe he harmed her. They had also found out that George Diaz Jr., or Cruz, her husband, was convicted of attempted murder later on in his life. He also never filed for divorce, 
even after Camille disappeared. They did find contact information for him as they were investigating, but he never got back to them. One person that they had spoken to believed that Camille had been killed by a biker gang and was buried in the desert in order to sort of keep her quiet about the gang's criminal activity. One thing particularly interesting though is that they had spoken to a friend of Camille's that said that Camille had spent a lot of time with a police officer. This friend believes that the two had a very personal connection and that he may be involved in the disappearance. The reason why this piqued my interest is because we know that her file was mysteriously deleted from the system not long after the missing persons report was filed, so that could be a possible answer to why that happened. The other possibility is that the mafia is involved. Someone who was close to Camille said that Camille had actually been talking about being approached by a police officer who was asking her to be a confidential informant against the owners of the Crazy Horse bars, which is where she worked. Like I mentioned earlier, the Crazy Horse chain was known to be owned by a mobster. Sherry, the friend that I mentioned earlier, also thinks that she could have possibly been a police informant. Apparently, Sherry had sort of gone through and called a lot of the phone numbers in her phone book after she went missing. And one of these numbers was named Dimitri but the number actually belonged to the FBI. Many people also believe that Rick Rizzolo, one of Camille's bosses at the Crazy Horse, had killed several people and buried them in the desert. Now, we will get more into the theories in just a minute, but after finding out all of this information, Ashley and Gabby thought that maybe after coming to Las Vegas with police with this new information that the police might be more interested in looking to her case again. However, they were disappointed to find out that police still did not care whatsoever. They called the police several times, emailed them several times over many weeks, but everything was left unanswered. Camille's missing persons report also still labels her as being missing as of May 1994, but we know that's wrong since they literally arrested her and saw her in court in September of that year. So clearly, police were never interested in finding Camille and are still completely unwilling to even take a few minutes to look into her disappearance or correct the wrong information that's in their report. So now let's get more into some of the theories in this case. So it is possible that Gary Dotson was involved. Now, of course, Camille had been involved with a few other men after she left Gary and we didn't hear much about him after she left. So I don't know if he was still trying to contact her after she left or if he took it as an opportunity to get his life together and leave her alone. As far as I saw most recently, he was reportedly living a quiet life in a southern suburb of Chicago and just wanted to put everything behind him. However, we know that Camille left the state with her daughter. We know that he was abusive. We know that he was a very loose cannon. He seemed to want to control Camille and Ashley in every aspect. It just doesn't seem likely to me that Camille would have been able to just leave the state with his daughter and that he would just let them leave with no fuss. Maybe he had been looking for her all of those years and then eventually found her and found out that, you know, she was with another man and did something to her. Maybe he had known that her life had spiraled and knew that it would have been easy to do something to her. Now, I don't really know how likely any of this is. I don't know if I even think that this is a plausible theory since we haven't really heard anything about him after he left. I would like to know if he did try to get back together with her. Did he call her? Did he try and go and find her? Or did he just leave her alone? Did he clean himself up? Did he try to get back into her life after he cleaned himself up? Those are the questions that I feel like if we did have answers to that we may know if we should rule out Gary Dotson or not. I will say that I do feel that if Ashley had written all of these articles about what could have happened, she might have mentioned Gary if 
she thought that it was possible that he was involved but at the same time, I'm just not sure. The next theory is that either Cruz Diaz or Kiko Fernandez is responsible. Both of these men were known to be abusive. Both of these men were involved in drugs. Both of these men had the ability to take advantage of Camille as she was in a place in her life where she was heavily dependent on drugs. It could be possible that she left Cruz for Kiko, Cruz got angry and he did something to Camille. I think that it's very possible since, again, he was very abusive to her. Chances are he wouldn't have just let her leave to be with another man and would be perfectly fine with it. Plus, he never filed for divorce. This can be looked at in two different ways. Maybe he loved her and even when she went missing, he had no idea what happened to her, but he just couldn't let go of her, so he just didn't file for divorce. Or maybe he was so possessive and controlling that he did something to her and just never divorced her either because he knew that it would look bad or because he wanted everyone to know that she belonged to him forever no matter what happened. It's also possible that Kiko's the one that did something to her. Again, he was abusive and he was the last person that was known to be living with her he could have done something to her for whatever reason and we just never found out because no one cared to look all of the men that she had been with unfortunately were abusive and possessive and could have very possibly done something to her it's just a question of who so the next theory is that this is mob related like i mentioned earlier the owners of the clubs that she danced at were mob owned and it's possible that she was working as an FBI informant. These bosses could have found out what she was doing and just got rid of her to keep her from talking. I think it is very possible and definitely shouldn't be ruled out. There are a few things that are pointing directly towards this that I mentioned earlier about going to the friend about working for the FBI and the fact that the friend had found the phone number under Dimitri that goes to the FBI instead. I think these factors alone could point to the fact that this is mob related. The next theory is that she truly was involved with a police officer who did something to her. Now there isn't a ton pointing to this theory besides the fact that a friend did say she had been speaking to a cop and the fact that her file was deleted. I do think that it's completely suspicious that her file was deleted, but at the same time, she was a dancer who was on drugs. Cops often do not take these cases very seriously at all. Obviously, they are human beings who deserve justice just as any other human being does, but in a lot of cases, law enforcement just doesn't see it that way. A lot of these cases just are not given the interest or the resources that they need, so it wouldn't be a big surprise if people just didn't want to investigate this case because she was involved in the things that she was involved with. I do think it's possible that she could have been involved with an officer, but given these other theories, I just don't think that's the most likely. I think a police officer could have just deleted her file because they didn't think that it was serious and they didn't want to look into it, or it could have just been accidentally deleted somehow. Either way, it is possible that she was involved with a cop. There's just not a ton pointing directly towards that. So the next theory is that this was a completely random attack. We know that she was a sex worker and that already puts her at a significantly higher risk of being harmed or kidnapped. It's always possible that someone took advantage of her and again, because of what she was involved with, no one bothered to look for her, so this person just got off scot-free. And the last theory is that it's always possible that she decided to leave on her own accord. We know that her life was spiraling out of control. We know that she had several warrants out for her arrest. We know that she had already been separated from her daughter since Barbara took her with her to Chicago. It's possible that she knew she needed to make changes in her life, so she took action. But she was involved with drugs. She was involved with all of these abusive men and had arrest warrants out for her and she worked for the mafia, so we know that it's probably 
pretty much impossible that she could have just hopped on a plane and went home with no questions asked. If she was going to leave, she would have had to have left by disguising herself and adopting a new identity. She was at the point where if she decided that she wanted to change her life, she would need to change her identity and disappear without telling a single soul where she was. One, so that police couldn't track her down and arrest her. Also, so that the abusive men couldn't track down and find her. Also, so that the mob couldn't track her down. Maybe Kiko Fernandez helped her get to Mexico or Cuba. Or maybe she had the help of someone completely different. But it is always possible that she did just decide to leave. I also think about the fact that Ashley herself had mentioned that in their last ever phone call with her mother, it sounded like she knew that she would be leaving. Maybe she wanted to get this one last conversation in before she left. It is always possible that if she knew she was about to be harmed by someone, possibly the mafia, that that's why she sounded like she was about to leave in this phone call. But I also think that it's possible that you know, before leaving, she wanted to have this last phone call with her daughter and said goodbye because she knew that she was leaving. I also almost wonder if maybe police helped her leave too. Now, this is something that is completely off the top of my head and I have no idea if this is even realistic or anything like that, but maybe she was an informant and she was in so much danger that police hid her gave her a new identity and all that, and that's why they deleted the missing person's file. It's possible that they couldn't tell her family and didn't want to leave any sort of trace behind, so they just deleted it, didn't say anything, and that police today even have no idea. I honestly don't even know if that's how it works or could ever possibly work, but that is something that I wonder if it could be possible. Of course, going along with this theory, it's possible that she did decide to take her own life. Again, with that last phone call with her daughter and with her life spiraling out of control so severely, it's possible that this is the only way that she saw out. The really only thing that points me away from this theory of her just leaving is the fact that she was so reliant on drugs that I feel like if she did leave, she would have either have had to get off the drugs immediately, completely cold turkey, or is still on them just somewhere else, which would sort of defeat the purpose if she really did want to improve her life. If she wanted to leave and start over, I imagine that she would probably want to get off the drugs too, but it's near impossible to do so without any sort of help or intervention. Unless she found a way to go to rehab in another country with no records, I just don't know how that would work, but I don't know, it's always possible. It's always possible that Kiko had the connections, got her to another rehab facility with her new name and new identity. That is always possible, but I just don't know the logistics of how all that would work out, so, I'm not sure. So that is pretty much all of the information I have on today's case. This is one of those cases that has so many different possibilities, yet at the same time, we don't have a ton of details about her actual disappearance. I feel like there are just so many little pieces of the puzzle that we are missing that I wish that we could put it together because I feel like if we just had a little bit more information, we could roll people out and put a better picture together of what really happened. But where it is now, we can only theorize on the information that we have. All I can hope for now is that this video can spread Camille's face and her story since police did such a horrible job of doing so themselves. Camille Dardanes was a white woman with brown hair and hazel brown eyes. She stood at five feet seven inches tall and weighed about 125 to 145 pounds. Her teeth were slightly discolored and her nose was recently broken. She had a tattoo on her right hip of the name Cruz. She smoked marble cigarettes 
and she may have used the first names Nicole, Renee, Kim, and the last names Clark or Diaz. She was 30 when she disappeared and would be 55 years old now. She was last seen walking in the 300 block of South Casino Center Boulevard in the time shortly before her disappearance. If you knew her or had absolutely any information, even something that you might consider insignificant, please email findcamille at yahoo.com. Thank you guys so much for watching today's video and listening to Camille's story. At this point, Ashley just wants some answers. Camille was a human being who deserved justice and I really hope by making this video and talking about Camille that someone will remember something. Someone may even come forward with information that they didn't know that they knew since they had never even heard of Camille's case or her information because again, police did such a horrendous job of looking into it. Or at the very least, I hope to bring awareness and make a woman known who was just lost in the system of people who simply don't care about women who fall into the wrong life decisions. She has a family. She has people who love her and who care about her. They deserve answers and she deserves justice. So that is all I have for today's video and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that one of these abusive men had something to do with her disappearance or do you think that it was mafia related? Do you think that she left on her own accord? Please let me know down below. If you liked this video, please make sure to leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below along with all of my affiliate links. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to email them to me at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. I read every single case suggestion that I receive and every case that I cover here on my channel is a suggestion directly from you guys, so do not hesitate to send those over. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye!